Welcome to FYI, the four-year innovation podcast. This show offers an intellectual discussion on technologically enabled disruption, because investing in innovation starts with understanding it. To learn more, visit arc-invest.com. Arc Invest is a registered investment advisor focused on investing in disruptive innovation. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. It does not constitute either explicitly or implicitly any provision of services or products by ARC. All statements made regarding companies or securities are strictly beliefs and points of view held by ARC or podcast guests and are not endorsements or recommendations by ARC to buy, sell, or hold any security. Clients of ARC Investment Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Hello and welcome to FYI, ARC's four-year innovation podcast. Today we have with us Ryan Wyatt, the CEO of Polygon Studios. Ryan, super happy to have you on the show today. Uh, Wondering if you can just give us a quick background to start and talk a little bit about your journey from the world of Web 2 to the world of Web 3. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. It's great to be spending some time with you guys this afternoon. So basically, I got into games at a really young age. I was like three years old. I got really into video games played competitively, got really into esports in high school and in college and decided to kind of pursue that as a job, not playing, but working in the esports industry. And so worked with a company called Major League Gaming, was later acquired by Activision Blizzard and became Call of Duty League and Overwatch League that you know it is today, which is really fun, right? This was like when esports tournaments were in hotel ballrooms, was really small, didn't get any viewership on streams. Then I went to a company called Machinima and started this kind of focus on what we now call the creator economy. And this was 2009. So creators weren't monetizing content yet. They were just kind of uploading content, you know, and this is the era of YouTube where it was, you know, cat videos and people starting to vlog in that concept. Gaming videos were just either like terrible montages or just a clip of a cool piece of gameplay with, you know, no, no commentary or anything. So I started my career at Machinima and then basically dedicated what would end up being the next 13 years very specifically to the creator economy. Because I ultimately went to YouTube as the first head of gaming, was brought on by uh, Susan, our CEO, and started the gaming vertical at YouTube and spent eight, almost eight years doing that. And you know what I was doing there is a variety of roles. One, it was the maturation of the creator economy, like from monetizing ads on mobile to alternative monetization, to live streaming, to just gaming being the second biggest vertical on YouTube after music, right? And so it was a multi-billion dollar business for YouTube because of the ads monetization in front of the content, obviously the demographic that gaming has and the advertisers targeting against that. And then kind of the products that we would focus for both gaming publishers and developers that looked at YouTube as this incredible marketing vehicle. And then as well as the you know creators that were creating content and monetizing. So it was super fun, right? Got to be a part of YouTube's astronomical growth, learned a lot uh, from being at YouTube, both good and bad and otherwise. And then started really getting into Web3. I actually was not this, like, not huge into crypto. You know, been following it, but I would not self-identify as, like, crypto native at all. I got into it last year as far as, like, spending time, money, and energy into it last year because I started to see some projects of games that were, you know, Web3 games from game developers that I really admired and respected. And, you know, I was like, well, what the, what, you know, what the hell is like, what is this? You know, like, but like web three games, I have no idea what you mean when you say this, right? So this is, you know, I don't know what, a little over a year ago, a uh, year and a half ago. And so I started spending more time in the space. I was like, all right, you know, and the, you know, it, with people that I admire and respect. And so long story short, after spending so much time being an angel investor in the space, I thought that would kind of just, you know, keep it at bay. And I just became very enamored with, the possibilities. I mean, there's so much that could work, may work, may not work. The unknowns really got me excited about it. Same way that the creator economy before it was even that got me excited. I'm like, that's kind of cool. Like people are creating videos that other people want to watch. It doesn't have to just be premium, you know, premium cable television. I like watching gaming videos and cool highlights. Let's see where we can go with this. I didn't expect it to be a multi-billion dollar business streaming platforms and gaming creators making millions of dollars. And that's how it turned out. And so I just saw a lot of similarities in Web3 of who knows, right? We don't know. No one knows, right? Whether you're pro Web3 or anti Web3. And I kind of love that life short. It was exciting, you know, to partake in that and figure it all out. 
Um, and so I jumped over to Polygon, where I'm the CEO of Polygon Studios now, and I joined in February. Can you maybe touch on just, you know, the difference between Polygon Studios and the Polygon Protocol and, and explain for the listeners just that dichotomy there? Yeah, yeah. So Polygon Studios is the business for Polygon in which we are basically advancing kind of the Polygon protocol. So we are a little bit of church and state, right? We really believe in, you know, the the platform and ecosystem moving towards complete decentralization. But the business team in the interim, much like Solana Labs or Avalanche Labs is doing for their respective chains, is making sure that we have, you know, established business organization that can kind of help with the advancement of Polygon's ecosystem. And so that's what that team is. And so, you know, it's not any engineers or developers that are actually sitting on Polygon, but we're helping that ecosystem. So whether it's the BD, the partnerships, marketing, you know, and all that comes with kind of running the business side, that's what Polygon Studios is. You know, of late, you know, and how Polygon Studios started was with a very specific focus on just gaming and NFTs. And over time, Studios has kind of taken over what is just all of kind of Polygon's business. And that was more of making sure we remove kind of redundant work streams and some of the things that were happening across the space. And so it's been fun. I think it makes it much cleaner on, on how people think about us externally, how we focus and orient around serving the protocol. And uh, that's what Polygon Studios is. That makes sense. And super helpful to kind of understand the role of Polygon Studios. Maybe for our listeners that are less familiar with kind of the, the whole ecosystem of scaling technologies and they see kind of these layer ones like Ethereum or Solana talking about throughput, like how do you put all this in context uh, and how does Polygon have a role there? Yeah, you know, I think like when, even when, on a personal level, like when I was looking at how I wanted to enter the space and where to, you know, where to make my personal bet on to spend my time and energy, you know, I really thought there's already a lot of variables that make the whole space high risk. And I think, you know, those are well understood. And so one of them being where are users and developers already at? And so when you look at kind of that from a macro perspective and you look at an Avalanche or a Solana or Ethereum, it's very clear Ethereum far and away has that ecosystem relative to the other L1s, right? And so for me, I was like, well, naturally people want to be where developers are and where users are. It's just like a very smart place to find yourself to be and in mass. And so what we said is, look, Ethereum has an infinite scaling challenge that this is not going to go away. And although they'll continue to progress at it as we scale with the merge and some of the stuff that's happening, um, that doesn't happen overnight, right? Just switching to a proof of stake is not going to allow them to just scale and not need L2s. And so we kind of looked at it as if this space is going to be really successful, it's going to have a high volume of transactions. It's going to have a high volume of users and it's going to have a lot of developers. So let's solve the transaction scaling element for Ethereum, since that will be a perpetual problem if the space continues to grow, right? If Ethereum ever gets to a point where it can actually handle the transaction load, then Web3 at like is kind of a bust in my mind, right? You know, you've got to be betting that that Web3 is going to have some meaningful level of transactions that will always kind of require scaling. So I just got really anchored around Polygon. And the reason I like Polygon was the ZK bets that they made, right? They, you know, Polygon before I joined acquired three ZK companies and spent a billion dollars acquiring these three. And effectively to not get too technical for the audience, you know, our bet is that our ZK scaling solutions will allow us to be able, like it's a very defining moment for the company because it means we have an ability, a, a solution to scale Ethereum, you know, as we take on all these big partnerships that we're striking and all these big games that are building on Polygon. And so it was a pretty big breakthrough because right now the chain that we have is, is not a chain that would allow you to scale long-term, right, as we get more traction. So anyway, I look at it much less of, you know, I think the narrative is like, obviously you look at Solana and Avalanche and Immutable and Polygon, and yes, you know, I think they are competitors. I think of us very uniquely is we're trying to support people that are on Ethereum. And so it's not, it's like what another L1 is doing really doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, you might have something that you wanted to be on this L2 that goes and builds on an L1 and that's... You know, that's unfortunate as like a from a partnership perspective or business perspective, but just saying heads down and saying, we're here to serve the people that have chosen to be a part of the Ethereum ecosystem. And we're going to scale that. It allows you to have way more tunnel vision, in which case then I think of our competitors are more of those that are helping scale Ethereum as well, like less alternative L1s, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think you touched on this a bit, but I think Polygon's approach has been, you know, 
get the proof of stake existing, you know, polygon chain out there that's really like a side chain, get some leeway to start working on several different scaling implementation. That's kind of like, you know, we're building many products to help scale and there's going to be different uh, rollups that are best fit for different use cases. And I think that's resonated pretty well. Thank you. And I think that's, I think now we have to, we've got to clean up our like product narrative for everybody, right? Because it's confusing. It's hard to follow the space as is, right? Just like out of the box, when you look at Web3 and you're trying to assess different platforms and chains, it's just a lot. And so we have to simplify that. We shouldn't make it, do we want to have a la carte and optionality? For sure, right? But that needs to be very simplified. It needs to be articulated. It needs to have a clear kind of product roadmap and vision so that people that build tooling, developers, whatever it might be, are in line with that vision with us well. So that's kind of what we're doing next. You know, we we feel like we did the hard part first, which is to have the scaling product that you are confident to build a, a large company on into the future. And so now it's how do we make sure we communicate and articulate that and and get people aligned with that vision? But going back to like the POS chain, the side chain, right? It's it does exactly what we needed to do in the current environment. And it is definitely, I've always looked at it as like it's more than good enough to serve Web3 right now. And it was never our bet long term. And so we feel really good about kind of where we're at on the product side. And look, I think, you know, you see a bunch of large partners are working with us both in Web2 and in Web3 gaming. And I think we've we've been able to kind of get people aligned on on what Polygon's future is going to look like. In terms of maybe summarizing and, and asking a question here. So you see, you know, Polygon has a technical implementation built out. As you mentioned, that's kind of the hard part of the, you know, the, the product roadmap. So in terms of Polygon Studios and, and what you're building in the studio segment, what does that product roadmap look like? You talked about NFTs. You have mentioned gaming a few times. Like what exactly are the businesses that you're going after to try to attract them into this Web3 ecosystem? We aren't building any products on the Polygon Studio side, right? Like we basically are at service to getting people on the POS chain, getting people on our supernats, getting people integrated on our ZK Evan. And when you ask like who's people, it's, you know, it's the tooling, it's whether it's marketplaces, it's wallets, developer ecosystem, it's liquidity, right? It's all of these different things. And so, you know, our team is making sure when you want to build on Polygon, you've got somebody you can talk to to help do that, right? Whether it's as simple as like, hey, we need help with, you know, you know looking at our smart contracts or, you know, our token designer, hey, you know, we're making a game. What are your thoughts on, you know, rolling out our NFT strategy this way versus this way, right? And so basically that's what we, we are, are, are truly just the business function of Polygon and everything that it takes to kind of run that. We actually, Studios is kind of a funny name because we're not really a studio. We're not making any games in-house. We're not generate, we're not creating any kind of IP in-house. And that's very intentional because I would never want to see us be at odds with any of the people that are building. So like, say we had a studio where we were making an MMORPG at Polygon Studios. I would look at it as like other MMORPGs that want to be on Polygon would be like, are they really going to act in my best interest to make sure that our game is really successful on Polygon? Or are they going to make sure their game continues to be successful? And so there might be a time in the future where Polygon does do some of these things in-house. I would never rule it out. But right now, I, you know, the, the focus of the company is to be obsessive over developers. And anything that you're doing that distracts you from that is a disservice to the advancement of the ecosystem from my perspective. And so everything we should be doing is how do you help developers? How do you give them scale resources, doing hackathons? How do you market? How do you promote them? How do you make sure that they're getting all of the like materials that they need to iterate on their, on their business model? Fund them on the venture side, right? Um, you know, give grants out, right? So everything is focused on supporting developers building on Polygon, whether it's DeFi, games, an NFT project, or Facebook. Got it. And that fits very much with the ethos of Web3, right? You're wanting to support this decentralized developer network with the helping hand, which is now Polygon Studios. So maybe, maybe let me reframe the question I asked you then. What are developers building for Polygon that you're seeing come through Polygon Studios? What has been kind of the, the biggest draw for developers uh, uh, you know, using Polygon? I think we've been the most successful at bringing web two companies in. So it's different. It depends on like what group we're talking about. I think we've been the most successful bringing web two companies to web three for a couple reasons. 
One, I think they quickly come to the same conclusion around Ethereum that we do, right? Where it's like, okay, that's a proven, like that has that has legs, that has history, that has users, that has liquidity, that has developers. There's a lot of traction on Ethereum. So that may, and like the other, these other L1s haven't been around for a while, so we don't know. So it's, you know, we'll attach to that idea. And then it's like, okay, let's evaluate how best to build on Ethereum and then look at the offerings that you have across that. And so then I think they come to Polygon because if you look at the kind of executive team we've brought in, you know, it's people, you know, 20 years at EA, you know, 10 years at Unity, eight years running marketing at Facebook. Like we've got really great kind of web two, web three hybrid executives. And so we have, a, I think, a BD team that knows what good looks like and how to operate at a high level. And I think people, you know, like to associate with that and it gives comfort knowing that you've got a strong partnership because you're going to be working for many years together. And I think the last part is, you know, our, kind of our, our carbon footprint narrative where we're carbon neutral, right, in doing, you know, carbon uh, credit offsets. And so I think when people think about really what's important if you're going to build on chain is doing it in a sustainable way. And so when you kind of look at it, they're like, Boom, right? That's why we'll choose Polygon. Now, what is starting to happen is a, is a significant snowball effect because then you're like, well, Stripe, HTC, DraftKings, Reddit, Facebook, they're all on Polygon. And yeah, so you're, they're ob you know, Reddit obviously is a multi chain, and some of these will continue to be multi chain. But a very consistent theme is Polygon is part of that strategy, right? And I do think the world will be multi chain, and I think that's okay, right? I think that's not a bad thing. But I think Polygon will continue to be a part of all of this. And so I think that's the Web 2 reason. I think Web 3 is very similar, though, in nature, why, why, you know, why they're building on Polygon as well. And we have a games team. I also think we have, you know, when you think about the, bat, like the people we've hired from the games industry, when you are in game development, you want to work with people that know and have been a part of the games ecosystem. And there's a bunch of different ways, whether it's like on the platform side, the publisher side, the game development side, the engineering side, right? The, the marketing side, even stuff like my background, which is actually, you know, parallel to the game industry of watching people play video games, the creator economy. And so I think we've got a robust and well-rounded team that can actually really, really support game developers better than anyone else. And I think gaming has been a really fun and probably a good segue here, but I think gaming has been a really fun category within web three that has a lot of promise and potential but hasn't fully come to life at all yet and um i think that's probably one of the more promising verticals but al also heavily debated and contentious too which is why i kind of like it yeah I, I think that is a great segue i mean one question is just what differentiates a web three game from a web two game and and why do these companies both traditional and new want to build on a decentralized infrastructure you know i don't know that i look at it as like a differentiation between web two and web three games i think the appetite and why people are excited to build on it is there is a new like tool set you can use to make games and a different kind of community of let's face it like big spenders right and games industry has loved making things cater to whales the free-to-play model is effectively that it's like why people hated the free-to-play model to begin with and that's like people with money and people with time right that is how that thing goes round right and um i think what's interesting is now the dynamics like the tool set the game developers have in web3 there is like a lot of different things that you can do and like people push out, like fundraising is a great example, like fundraising just through the community through an NFT presale, right? Can't do that in web two. Like, could you do a Kickstarter? Sure, but that's a very unique way to get a community, like to bootstrap, fundraise a game, solely the community, circumvent VC if you want, or even let VC just buy as part of the NFT kind of purchasing, right? Like they can partake in different ways. I think there's cool ideas around depending on how much, you know, like tokens you own, how much governance you have, how people can kind of pool together to be provide actionable feedback for game developers around governance. And these are just like, I think, again, cool, unique tools for game development. We'll see, like, because like one of my favorite games I play is Valorant, right? It's a tactical shooter by um, by Riot Games. And I grew up playing Counter-Strike, so I just like absolutely love it. You could effectively move Valorant on, on chain and what you would do on chain could just be the cosmetic items, like finite amount of digital items, who owns them, take them to marketplaces that you want, trade them accordingly, know that like, oh, I had Frank's 
you know, bayonet fade knife before. Now it's mine. Like very specifically, this is Frank's knife. It's not just any bayonet fade knife. And there's things that you could do to replicate some of this stuff in like SQL centralized, you know, manner. Like we could call web like foe 2.5. But when you move this like space to like the spirit of the actual game development is this, you know, like that we're going to allow the, the, these things will be genuinely owned. You will have visibility into these things. The way you participate in this game will be very uniquely in community uh, focus. I think it just kind of unlocks different, it unlocks different features for game developers and gaming users in my mind. Now, the question is, like, what will that turn into? Will that be meaningful or not? And I have always taken a step back and it's like, there's three billion gamers, right? Two and a half, three, depending on whatever study you want to believe. And I'm like, even if five to 10% of the gaming, of the, of the whole total addressable market of gaming industry gets into blockchain games, it's like, you know, we're talking about hundreds of millions of people, right? And that's great. And, and, and I think of it more as blockchain games. Web3 games, crypto games, whatever you want to call them. I like calling them blockchain-based games. That's, the, the, I guess, the flavor of the month. Um, <laughs> you know, right? We gotta, it's, it's always something like crypto, right? Um, always changing. I, yeah, always changing, right? It's like, we'll try a different term. NFT didn't go well. Let's call blockchain-based games. Um, I think, you know, it will. It, that's a huge audience to serve, and that will be great, right? It'll be a subsection of the games industry, another category, and it will be, uh, you know, one worth pursuing. And so, yeah, I, I think of I think those will be big things. I do feel what will happen is there will be this unique interest in whales coming over, like whales that are in the free to play model as they find games that look more like the ones that they like. Like, oh, I like playing Valorant. If I see a, tac a high polished tactical shooter that's in Web3 on chain, that might pull me off of Valorant as, an, as a, just a gamer. And I'm not going to come back because I've spent now, I've spent so much money on Valorant just on skins. And even if you've only spent like hundreds of bucks, 50 bucks, whatever, it's like, it's just money out. You know, it's one purchase and you're done. It's like riots. You have that skin, you get, you get kicked off or whatever. You lose it. You can't trade that skin. You can't give it to your buddy. You can't rent it out to them. You have no rights. And so if, even if you see that happen and people go into like a web three game because of it, my hope is still that you have this forcing function of behavioral change in with web two game developers that says we might not go build our game on chain. But we, do, we have this belief that people that spend money on our digital items should have some rights that are equivalent to that of the physical world. And even if they don't go full blockchain-based games, that's a win for gamers, right? Like that's a win, you know? And that has, they've kind of shied away from that. Steam, even with Counter-Strike, you can sell your skins, but that money stays in the ecosystem. And so what you see is like, hundreds of millions of dollars of transactions that are happening within that ecosystem, they all stay within the wall garden of steam. And to the point where you actually see these, you know, off like markets, like black markets, where they're holding these digital items in escrow and trading, and then doing like PayPal payments to pull them out. It's like insane, right? I just fundamentally believe that we should have more like, di like rights, like digital rights as we spend billions of dollars in digital items in cosmetics, not just in gaming, right? Digital worlds, metaverse, whatever you want to call it. Also flavor of the month term. I'm sure we'll talk about it. I just believe in kind of the digital rights thing, long-winded. It makes a lot of sense. I think, um, you know, and it's awesome that you're, you're a gamer. So you get this idea of spending money on free to play games and how it works. Like I, I I'm still like, I'm partially a gamer, but still sometimes amazed when I hear how much money is spent on Fortnite skins that they don't make you any better at the game, but, but they make you look cool. All cosmetics. Yeah. This is like, you know, like a lot of people that are driving these game dynamics are, you know, degenerates like me that are putting money in, you know, why do I own 13 different knives on Valorant and I play with one, you know, it's like, it's silly, you know? And I think there's cool things that game developers will be able to do too. You can't build by committee, but I do think things of how you get people involved with governance as well. You know, they, going back to Valorant, they just made this update to Chamber and, and nerf some of them. He's like this new agent in Valorant. And it's cool, right? Like, I think you could do stuff where the community could weigh in on some of these different things uh, and you could be doing voting and stuff. And again, not all of this is necessarily not achievable in web two. But it goes back to like the core principles of what a Web3 game is. That's why I think you will see like people that believe in these things where it's like community should have some ownership. I should be able to, you know, if you bought, like imagine I bought, I bought a skin in, in season one of Valorant when there wasn't that many people playing. 
and that skin never comes around again, that thing would have a lot of value. It's very unique. It's a season one skin. It's only 12,000 of them that was ever made. Now we're in season 12. You know, I don't know what season, but you, you know, it, it's like we have a you know, 10X the user base. I should be able to sell that knife that I bought for five bucks for 500 if somebody wants to buy that knife from me, right? And there's like, people get stuck up on play to earn because I think that is a bad, like we should stay away from some of the play to earn concepts. But I look at that as a really cool concept of like, I invested in this game as like a player. You know, I participated in this game early and I got to actually see the upside value of the game just like the game publisher did of Valorant success. Yeah, it might've only been like, I sold my knife for more money. And then people are like, oh yeah, you can lose it. It's like, what do you think's happening now? It's like, that's all that's happening now. It's like, I literally will spend money on an item and that's it. That's no, no refunds, it's gone. It immediately goes to zero, right? So I don't even know that I, 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 um, I worry too much about like volatility in the market because the standard right now is like, it's just you put money in it in and in in they just take it from you, right? So, yeah. It's so interesting to hear you describe it in this manner. And like, I almost had an epiphany listening to you because like, the, the parallels between the way that you describe this like demand for this peer to peer marketplace for games is kind of the same way that Bitcoin and Ethereum grew in adoption, right? Like there was demand outside of the traditional banking system for some of these features that weren't allowed, but were always kind of there. And that's the same thing with gaming, right? You had this demand to be able to trade skins, to be able to trade accounts. I mean, how many marketplaces get spun up each year and then get subsequently shut down? for people like us to trade Valorant skins or Fortnite skins, right? And so drawing that to now blockchain, like that is the ethos, right? Like being able to have that peer-to-peer -peer networking effect in marketplace is the, I think like the low, like the first layer to the like blockchain-based gaming. And then, you know, as you mentioned, right, you have like all of these different business models that you can tack onto it, whether it be play to earn or play and earn. That's kind of what, that's our flavor of the month. We like to call it play and earn. Um, negative connotations maybe when it's play to earn but yeah it was just yeah no, really interesting to hear you explain it in that manner because it's so true as a gamer myself right there's always been that demand i mean i've had friends playing world of warcraft for years and always you know building up uh characters and selling them off right like that's just always been a part of the gaming ecosystem and so it makes you know sense that that that's going to be a major draw for gamers um and i think one thing that's going to be really interesting here too is at, when you allow that functionality, when you allow for that type of economy, digital economy to evolve, you'll have whales spend significantly more money in that ecosystem than they ever would in, you know, a Web2 game. A million percent. When you know there's like a liquidity there, I, I agree, right? Because it's like now you have the optionality of moving it and trading it and selling it and right. And I think, look, that'll be a forcing function. You know, there's the, the thing about whales is there's not a lot of them. So when they move, right, relative to that 3 billion TAM, right? So the games industry doesn't matter. You know, here's the thing, like none of our opinions matter. Like it's really, they will cater to the whales, right? And so, and then I think that experience is opens up just like free to play. It's awesome. Like that's awesome, right? Free to play. Now you can go play Fortnite. You can go jump on and play one of these games and not have to spend anything. And you don't have to worry about getting absolutely destroyed because somebody did spend a thousand bucks because they just look really cool. They got like flames and shit, but you know, and some really pretty, you know, pickaxe and you know, an awesome John Wick skin, but there's no unique attributes that make them better than you, right? And I love that. Everybody kind of wins in that model for free to play because of that, right? Uh, they're subsidizing the game experience for others. There will be cool stuff that comes from it. I, my take on it too is, I think a lot of like the criticism of the space is like, well, where's the, you know, where's the like killer consumer app? And, you know, I got to look at it. I'm like, oh my goodness, this is such a, this is so nascent, right? You know, as far as like building dApps and so forth of thinking about what you can do with it. And so I have a much more patient approach of, of multi-year kind of time frame and horizon for some of these things to happen because it's none of this stuff. One, games take forever to make especially like high polished games. And then two, they're already hard to make and get success when you're not adding really tough challenges like balancing an economy inside of a game. And so you'll get a bunch of different games. You started with this first iteration of financialization first games, right? That that were played or earned and some of them were gross and Ponzi-nomics, some intentionally, some unintentionally, truly. I believe like not everybody maliciously acted in that. And then a lot of people look at it and like, oh, like we don't that's not it either, right? And who knows? Like there'll be another category that comes up, maybe it's played or whatever it is, and somebody will be like, 
that's not it. But that one part, you know, they're onto something, right? Like that part was cool. So we'll do it, you know, let's take that. And then at some point, you start to get a rhythm of what's going to happen here. So I'm excited. You know, we've got cool games that are on the horizon. We've got, you know, Dr. Disrespect. He's like a really big Twitch streamer. Started a games company called Midnight Society. And they've got a bunch of awesome OG game veterans that work there. You know, people that spent years on Gears of War and Call of Duty and all these incredible games. And they're making their game in Unreal Engine 5, right? New E5. And that's on Polygon, you know? But at the core of it, it's just like a really fun, new... It's not... It's not um, you know, I wouldn't want to call it's kind of, he's kind of got his own like style genre that he's taking. It's not really battle royale, but it's kind of taking themes from a couple different games. But long story short, it's like that's great, right? This will be the first time, you know, these like high polished games now are web three games. And we'll learn from that and we'll learn player behaviors and what they like. But one of those games, if it's not his dead drop game at Midnight Society, you go and like you start to see it's like oh, this game plays a lot like a, you know one of the, a, a shooter a web two shooter that I would like triple A web two shooter that I like and now all of a sudden I have like way more of these rights over voting and owning items and trading renting whatever it may be of these items you're gonna go back to another game right like then a new Call of Duty comes out and you're like this is shit man like I can't I'm just it's just money out you know and so I think what will happen is again I go back to the space that. People might not realize it yet, but over the next five years, they're going to care a lot more about digital rights. I mean, like, this is ridiculous. Like, if I buy this iPhone, I should be able to sell it, right? Like, I have that right. Or if I buy my Nike sneakers, I should be able to sell them on StockX. I think people are going to start to get, like, a little fussy over digital items being, like, wall garden and them having no no access to them. Yeah, it's, you, don't, you don't realize it until you're, you know, kicked out of a, a, a community and you lose all of that, right? And, and then you're like, oh, wow, I really wish I had, you know. Or even dude, you just roll like the new get, new Call of Duty comes out and all that money you spent on the one the last year you lost, right? So it's like, it's not even like, I don't even buy into the, oh, you know, I got wrongfully banned ideas. So like, no, I just, shit, you guys just came out with a new game. I spent 200 bucks on, you know, Warzone and like lost all, I, I can't do anything with this in the next Call of Duty, whatever, right? So I think it's probably more of that. And then I think just, you know, your point too, like people will be more apt to spend and transact. And I do think long-term, the revenue model will actually be better for game developers because then they will always make money off of the secondary sales. So it's like, I just sold you my, you know, Vandal and Valorant and you just sold it to Frank. And it's like, they made money off all three of us. And so they're going to get, I think it's just right now, NFTs, this gross word because of there's a bunch of bad stuff with NFTs, right? Like there's a bunch of bad stuff. But the internet, when it first came out, was like like littered with terrible shit, right? And so, of course, like I always look at the, when, when new technologies come up, it's always bad actors that jump first, right? And so, yeah, there's some like really cool NFT examples, no doubt. But like 98% of it is just absolute nonsense, right? Just nonsense, nonsense. And so people that aren't focusing on the space, just like, I look, I heard a monkey sold for, you know, $1.5 million. Like, it's bullshit, right? Like, this is all scam. And I'm like, how do you not agree and have empathy for these people that think that, right? It's like, I would, you know, if you're not in the day-to-day -day and have this vision of where it could potentially go, of course, right? I, I totally get where they're coming from. And so we just have a responsibility as a space long-term to start producing really cool use cases with the technology. And I think we're doing it. Maybe it's not the pace everybody wants to, but I'm pretty happy with it. And I think over the next two years, we've got some really cool stuff in the can. Just even at partnerships we have at Polygon, I'm so stoked about uh, sharing. So what do you think will be the tipping point in terms of you know mass adoption or incremental adoption for the Web3 space gaming? You, you know, We can talk about gaming too here, but do you, you, you'd mentioned like, oh, you know, people are looking for this killer app. Is it going to be a killer app in the future or is it just going to be this like organic growth? Do you think? It's probably a little bit of both. Like, I think there will be things that create in as you continue to see, you know, we had 160 million uh, unique addresses. Right. So what takes us to a billion? Right. I think it's just a road along the way and there might be some spikes like a cool game comes out, you know, and like. That's, you know, gets 10 million users and boom, that gives you a little spike or a rewards program comes out and that gives you, you know, a spike of 10 million or, you know, some of the stuff where we're doing like a, you know, a partnership with Facebook and DraftKings and all these things that gets another spike. Right. So I do think so. But I, it, but I think it will culminate into a handful of really killer apps that I actually feel like the, the, the end game is 
it's much more pa- like people aren't really like, oh, is this on chain? Just like you wouldn't be like, is this my plan a Google Cloud game or an AWS game? It's like you don't care, right? It's like you care that it's you know you have low ping in the lobby, right? You don't really care if it's Google Cloud or AWS or whatever it is, right? And so I do think what will happen is we'll get to a we'll get to a place in the next five years where games and apps. It's like, yeah, they're on chain, sure, right? But you're not, you know, it's just like, oh yeah, it's in the cloud. Now, like focusing on it too much. And that's where I want Polygon to really operate and be. Um, and just like why everyone picks AWS is you pick AWS because it's like known to be the best, right? I'm ex Google, so Google Cloud is awesome as well. You know, it's known to be the best, right? And so that's why you pick it. And you pick it because it's really stable and it offers the best service and the best costs and all of that. And that's where you wanna build, you wanna build on it. And so I want people to think of Polygon that way, but then a user really, you know, yeah, they're gonna be transacting with Polygon tokens. So it will be a little bit more in their thoughts, you know, than, you know, Matic token, like it be in their thoughts more than it would be like an AWS. I think it'll just kind of be happening naturally. Um, people are already so used to digital currencies too, as well. Like younger people, it's like, they're not, this is not as for, you know, we're, my mom's like, what is this, you know, digital tokens? It's like, come on, people, we've been dealing with gems and shit and all kinds of things for a while now. So, I, you know, like, I don't think it's that crazy. Like people kind of get the gist of it, you know? So one interesting observation um, that I think you've alluded to a few times is like, I feel like the social aspects of gaming and, and, and like broader media on chain has like done a lot to bring people into crypto that wouldn't have been in crypto otherwise. Like yourself is probably a good example. Like you're not in it for like decentralized lending markets, uh, which, you know, maybe both are equally large opportunities. Um, but it, it seems like going from that hundred million to a billion, you're not going to get a billion people that are like, truly caring about these ultimate decentralization and 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 DeFi protocols uh, in the same way you might about social experiences and games uh you know both are important but is that kind of how you see it as well yeah 100 i think of decentralization is like there's like a spectrum of how much you care about it and the people that are in it right now care about it like deeply right and that's cool right i think that's great like this whole centralized you know centralized financing versus decentralized finance is like a great conversation like with everything that's happening and then you can totally understand why you know you know like now your keys now your wallet you know all these different like a lot of stuff going around DeFi. i think is great as far as like you know the spirit of decentralization and what it means that's a spectrum though like there are a lot of people that might be like this is you know this is good enough right like decentralization to me is you know, information's available on chain and it's accessible and like we can build apps off of that and so forth. So I think it just varies depending on who you're talking about, as well as the use case. You might have a very different stance talking about decentralization relative to game development than you would talking about banking and finance, and which you would have very different set of arguments and principles that you would argue on. And so usually what I always find when people are super passionate about decentralization, it's really what's playing out right now and kind of these like collapses of some of these like centralized finance, you know, finance versus DeFi, right? Um, and so that that's kind of been like an interesting one. But yeah, I think 100%. Look, 99% of people are, they're going to just care about the Yeah, I care about digital rights, you know, like, let's make that happen. Right? Uh, or something. Yeah, yeah. In many ways, kind of the, the, the concept, the core ethos around self sovereign money and decentralized financial services you need it to kind of lay this base layer that then you can build kind of the gaming stuff and everything on because, you know, if digital asset marketplace is a digital asset marketplace, whether the assets are <laughs> token, like money, currency, or gems and swords. Yep, 100%. Rewinding a bit, you, you talked a bit about multi-chain and a lot in, you know, when I have talked about Web3 gaming, we hear a lot about, oh, interoperability. Being able, you know, the, yes, I see, I see your response already. So I'm going to tee you, I, I'll just tee you up then, right? Like, what is the feasibility of that? Because you always hear the example, oh, what, you know, how great would it be if you could jump from Fortnite to Call of Duty and bring over all of your skins and vice versa? Yeah, I mean, those people shouldn't be talking about gaming, though, you know? So what is the feasibility here in Web3? Like, well, in that case, zero. Interoperability, like where people just think like, you're like, oh, I have this, you know, this gun in Counter-Strike, like I'm going to bring it to Valorant. It's like those people need to absolutely stay away from commentating on the space full stop. That can't happen for like millions of reasons, like millions of reasons. Not even worth, we'd take another hour probably just talking about why that doesn't work. Now, 
there are cool things that I like about interoperability that I think you can do, right? I'll give you an example. And this isn't a real world. I'm just completely making this up. It doesn't exist. We don't have a partnership or anything. But like, say you take Prada does an NFT launch and you get a Prada backpack. You're like, all right, cool. I got one of a thousand Prada backpack NFTs. And that gives me like a discounted Prada. It lets me go to the fashion runway. And hey, look, it also supports 10 different games. What does that mean? I jump into X game and this Prada backpack can go, has been, you know, skinned by the game developer that, you know, if you have this Prada NFT, you can wear this Prada backpack. Now the game developer has to make it obviously within, you know, what, what engine are they on? You know, shaders, like what's like, they actually have to create the visual and virtual asset of it. But now it has added utility to that Prada NFT backpack, right? And then they could go do this, let's say with like 10 games or whatever, right? And so that if you hold that NFT, then like any of those games I play, I actually have this Prada backpack, which is then in theory is interoperable, right? I own the underlying NFT, but it's not like I just take the same digital asset and bring it across each one of those games. So like interoperability could be done there in a really cool way. And so another, you know, you could use it maybe like a better example would be like, John Wick skin is in Fortnite, right? Well, you know, if John Wick did a NFT drop for the movie, what if they just did that with like five different games and using web two games? Like what if they did like Valorant, Minecraft, Roblox, Fortnite? And it's like, yo, if you get the John Wick NFT, you get, you know, you get access to the movie or whatever, blah, blah, blah. They can do all this stuff. And you can actually have the John Wick skin in these five games. Then you have this level of interoperability. So I think that's like one way that you can see interoperability. I also think there's cool ideas going back to, we talked about Counter-Strike skins, right? You know, imagine if uh, you could make like an AK-47 skin. You know, it's like, oh, Beeple dropped an AK-47 skin. Great big NFT artist. He dropped a thousand of them. I could now buy that one, right? And so that's not necessarily interoperable for different games, but this dude made this digital like NFT asset within a video game, like as an artist became like a special guest and kind of developed it. Like that's a cool creator mechanism to monetize. Um, yeah. And so, and then I also think you could basically make a game too, where you could continue to feed NFT assets in, and then it could generate like a visualization, like a visual representation of that. Like, Oh, I have a doodle or I have a crypto punk or I have a board ape. And when I play that game, it like ingests the NFT and, you know, spits out like a digital asset version of that in the game. And you could have parameters that people could design and develop. And if you stay within these parameters, like you can kind of do cool stuff. We'll see versions of that. We'll see versions probably of like all three of these different concepts. That's when I think of like interoperability, it probably sits more there. You're just not going to get to these partnerships where like Activision's like, yeah, we're going to partner with Riot Games and all of your Call of Duty Warzone skins are going to work in Valor. It's like, that's never going to happen. And it shouldn't. That just sounds toxic to begin with. I mean, like nobody wants that either. Like nobody's asking for that. So this is why I think sometimes some of the, the ambassadors of like the gaming category in Web3 have actually done a disservice to like Web3 games because it, it, it's it's not the right way to orient so you can tell I'm pretty passionate about this interoperability argument, but I think there's something there to the the Prada backpack example, right? Uh, so time will tell. Well, I think from the use right from the user or I guess the owner of the Prada backpacks perspective, it will feel like interoperability. You don't know which cloud you're using. You won't know that it's technically a different Prada backpack being rendered in whatever game. You'll have that feeling of oh, I can jump from here to here to here. And look, I have this digital item that's represented in all of these versions. And that brings up like an interesting like thought where it's like, you're going to have third party marketplaces exist with third party items. And then you'll also have first party items built specifically for one individual world or game, which will also create like a very interesting dynamic between like, oh, I can only use this here versus I can use this in 10 different games or 10 different worlds which will bring with it its own like weird economics and uh, I'm sure like pricing power. Yeah, and I think like as you think about some NFTs where you could add underlying value, it could be brought away, like even using CryptoPunk as an example. Like imagine if you're like your punk, it just like when you go using these kind of same games, it's like when you go play Counter-Strike, you have a punk AK-47 skin. It's like not just the avatar of a CryptoPunk, but it's just like, oh, because you hold this underlying NFT, we did a part like we did, you know, CryptoPunks did a partnership with Counter-Strike. And so now you have this, like you have the skin, you get the access and it's a one of one, right? It's like, it's a unique skin match to your punk. And maybe it's just like the color scheme that's similar to the actual punk or whatever, right? You can just take this a million different directions and people will get there. 
all of this stuff that we talk about, it's easy to actually be very creative and think about these different concepts. Just a lot of stuff that needs to get built. Like we've got a, we've got a long way to go with marketplaces and wallets and on-ramps. But I also look at the progress made in nine months has been pretty incredible. So I don't think, you know, that's why I think like five years is sounds really long, but I think we'll actually have a lot of really cool stuff to show for it over that time frame. You know, even in the next, honestly, like Q1, Q2 of next year will look so different than the first half of this year on just, you know, like some of the tech that's rolling out across the board, not just even Polygon, some of the games, some of the consumer apps, some of the big web two companies that are doing stuff. So yeah, we're chugging along in this space. I know we, we want to get to the concept of the metaverse, but I do have a burning question for you because it's not often we get someone who has jumped from Web 2 to Web 3 at the level that you have. And this may be a, you know, a bit personal, but what was, what if any, was there like a cultural difference when you jumped from YouTube to Polygon in the way that you go about your day to day and kind of this ethos of Web 2 versus Web 3? Do you feel that? when you're, you know, working day to day, or is it just kind of business as usual? You're just, you know, working on a different web landscape. No, you know, like I, I think of even, you know, the spirit of kind of when I, when I joined YouTube in 2014, you know, you could really feel this, look, whatever we do, we have to do at the service of a creator, right? Like the backbone of YouTube is the creator economy. And so how do we actually service those creators? So I feel like a lot of that energy, like YouTube, I don't say I don't like, I love YouTube. I don't think they've lost it, but over time when you're 2 billion users, you kind of trying to be everything to everyone. It becomes a little bit harder to have that, you know, like heartbeat on something like that. That's so succinct. And we might, that might change for us over time too, as we get to 2 billion users, right? But you you can feel that heartbeat of like everything we do, we do for or for developers at large, right? And so I think that is felt at the company. It, re, it is very reminiscent to the early YouTube days for me as well. And so I dig that. And I think people do feel it. And I it's nice to have that feeling again. I would say a little bit different, kind of being like a general manager at YouTube of the gaming vertical versus like the CEO of our whole business. Um, like our business team, it is a little bit different because you're just spending time on a, a variety of different things that you wouldn't have, like you, you, that I took for maybe granted at YouTube, like spending time on people and some of these things where that just be, is a very well lubricated machine at Google, right? And that the that level of excellence that they actually have within culture and people is that is a lot of work to get to that. And so, you know, I'm thinking more of the things that I, of that and how you establish that and have those like, core values and principles and making sure that you're communicating with the company and setting the direction. It's fun. Like it's fun being a CEO to get to do that. But I feel like those are the unique differences for me. But I like being in, you know, I'm a, I'm a builder at heart. It's why I liked starting the gaming vertical and being at YouTube and building it out. And so I, you know, I'm 35 as well too. So I've got a lot of energy, you know, to like keep building. So I think that's what I, I notice a lot of similarities from from the early YouTube days to this. And, and and also even within YouTube, last thing was we felt like a startup inside of a really well-funded machine. And like Polygon's a really well-funded machine. And so even some of those similarities are there where you know you don't want to take it for granted, but it takes a it ta- it does take pressure off, right? Like we know we have runway. Like we're we're very fortunate to be able to say we as a company can have this multi-year time frame and patience to build and where it needs to get to. Like a lot of founders that are raising, you don't get that level of luxury. You're like, we got to figure it out. We're going to be raising in 24 months, right? You know, and and knocking on doors to start getting money again. And so you have, a, you have to create a sense of urgency. And so, yes, we have one, but it can be like more methodical and even keel. That's awesome. So maybe a bit of a cliffhanger to end on, because uh, I'm sure this is another one we can talk about for an hour or two. But um, what are your thoughts on, kind of the market's commentary around this metaverse concept. Are you bullish and bearish on what people think the metaverse is and what should they think the metaverse is? So Matthew Ball is, uh, you know, is an advisor for us. So we got to get to spend a lot of time with the metaverse king. Look, I think I'm bullish on my perspective of it, which is, <laughs> which is people are continuing to spend time in digital worlds and again on, on digital items, right? And I look at the metaverse as that. Like I don't overcomplicate it. I don't... You know, I think it's so multifaceted. You can take it in so many different ways. But at the end of the day, much like people started spending more time like locked into their mobile phones, like going from TV to PCs to mobile phones, they're going to start to spend more time in these like immersive digital environments. And they're going to spend money on digital items right inside of that. And so I kind of classify the metaverse simply as that, where it's this transition of just another thing. 
Now people take it in crazy directions. Like we're going to be wearing VR headsets and you know, like I, I'm not there on that. Like I can, I love VR so much and can't be in a headset for longer than 30 minutes. So I don't, I'm not I, like, depending on what avenue you want to go down on this discussion, I might join you or might not. And VR is one of them. I won't as much as I do love it. Uh, I just think there's like a finite amount of time you can wear, wear one. So anyway, that's kind of where I'm at. Digital worlds, spending money on digital environments, hence tying back to the original theme of digital rights. That's where I'm like bullish on metaverse. But that's why I don't like that you bundle, like bundling it like that is scary because I'm like, there's things I'm not bullish, like like super bearish on, in fact. And then there's parts of it where I'm like, that is that is the future, you know? Yeah, the concept of the metaverse has gotten so out of hand. You, you have to spend at least 30 minutes explaining what the metaverse is not to get to what the metaverse actually could be to ha have a, a, an actual discussion. But I think we're very much aligned in terms of Art's viewpoint of, of Web3 in that, you know, the core idea behind this and what's really exciting really just comes down to digital ownership. And if you can understand that and you can understand that people are going to spend more time online and then going to spend more money online and they're going to want to have ownership of what they spend money on, then you can you, you can see the opportunity. And if you can't, then maybe you, you shouldn't be talking about it, right? It's like, it boils down to very simple principles. And, and one of them is, is digital ownership, as you said. Dude, that's our whole, like, if you could have a very, like, synthesized, succinct approach of why Polygon exists, it's that. Like, we, we believe people should have rights over digital ownership. And, that, and that's, like, where we're focused, yeah. I don't think we can end it on a better note than that. Digital ownership, everyone. That's the summarization of the, the podcast. <laughs> Well, thanks for having me on, guys. Yeah, we appreciate it. Thanks for the yeah, time. Take care. Yeah, thank you so much. ARC believes that the information presented is accurate and was obtained from sources that ARC believes to be reliable. However, ARC does not guarantee the accuracy or completeness of any information, and such information may be subject to change without notice from ARC. Historical results are not indications of future results. Certain of the statements contained in this podcast may be statements of future expectations and other forward-looking statements that are based on ARC's current views and assumptions, and involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results, performance, or events to differ materially from those expressed or implied in such statements.